So today I'd like to introduce Robin Schlinger, LCSW. Robin's company, Robin Schlinger LCSW has multiple components, including supervision, coaching and training, all with an anti-oppressive and anti-racist lens. Robin also has a small private practice and she's a leadership team member of European Descent. Robin, can you tell me a little bit about each of those components of your organization? Uh, thank you so much, Amira. Um, so um, lots of pieces. So the first, I would say that everything in that is all encompassed with using an anti-racist lens to do that work. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a small private practice right now that really focuses on all those clients that I see are white and they're really coming, they're people that have had mental health histories and have had treatment, mm -hmm. but are now kind of saying, um, I want to be, I want to look at this through the lens of somebody who understands whiteness and understands racism as a white person to look Amazing. at how that impacts me. Um, so it's a different way of working, um, you know, looking at how whiteness how as a white person, it can dehumanize us and certainly many of the ways that we want to look at how it plays into our own sickness, right? So mm -hmm. that's one component. Um, the supervision that I do is also with that component. So I, some, I supervise a couple folks that are working towards their hours. Mm -hmm. um, and I also supervise more folks who have their hours, but are really looking again at kind of how do I do my work from an anti-racist perspective? Um, right Terrific. now, all of those clients happen to be white. I have supervised some folks of color um, mm -hmm. in the past as well. And then the cons the coaching is similar again. Um, yeah. It's, you know, in various areas, executive to, you know, just a person who's working and wants to look at like how things are showing up for them in their work or in their life. And then a lot of the workshops and trainings um, and consultants and consulting all around that workshops. Yeah. Um, and the last piece I think you mentioned about European descent mm -hmm. really goes back to kind of like um, my red pill, you know, my matrix, like red pill, blue pill. Yeah. So um, I attended the People's Institutes Undoing Racism and Community Organizing workshop when I was working with um, a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was it. Like nothing, my entire life shifted after that. It was like, wow. again, I took the red mm -hmm. pill and I was like, oh, this is the real world. Um, I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, just couldn't, couldn't shift back even if I wanted to. So I would say yeah. like, that was the big shift. And then after taking that workshop, I wanted to continue doing some work. And so through People's Institute, they have other kind of like working groups and monthly meetings where people are continuing to collaborate. So European Descent, which is spelled D-I-S-S-E-N-T, uh -huh. um, is a group of white folks of European descent that are trying to um, undo racism in themselves and in others. And so I've been active with them pretty much two months after I took, I took the workshop. Yeah. Um, and I've become active in the last year or two, which has really been a nice experience is more active with PSAB themselves mm -hmm. um, with the Northeast kind of region and being on kind of the leadership steering committee team, mm -hmm. which is a diverse group of folks. Um, and that's been new for about the past year. So that's, that's where my roots are. Um, I yeah. just, I credit them and I want to give back and do as much as I can. Um, yeah, I completely hear you. Yeah. I also had the pleasure of, of attending their workshops. And you know, know, a few times, and it was definitely life changing for me. Yeah. So I completely hear you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Robin, um, what was it like for you emotionally to start your business? What were some of your fears, your challenges, areas where you felt strong? Yeah. Um, I never, ever thought I wanted to have my own business. I mean, I remember people mm -hmm. telling me, oh, you should go on your own. You should do this. You should do that. And I just, I was like, you know, I'm not that brave. I want to have a steady mm -hmm. paycheck coming in every month. Yeah. I want to know how I'm getting paid, that I'm getting paid. The idea of having to like hustle and, um, you know, scared the crap out of me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was 
I the the non the nonprofit where I was working kind of got moved out of a job. And I, I had two weeks to kind of say, oh, wow, what am I going to do here? Um, so yeah. I thought, all right, I'm going to have to, my first thought was just like, all right, I'm going to have to beef up my private practice. Like, I'm just going to have to do private practice full time. Mm-hmm. And what started to happen is I had, so I had signed up with a coaching group. There was a woman who was piloting this coaching program. And it was a wonderful program, but it wasn't working for me. We were trying to find all these, like, who's your knit? Like, what group do you want? Write yeah. something to your per- to your client. Like, who do you want your client to be? And it just wasn't gelling for me. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I was I started to think, I know why this is not gelling for me. This isn't mm-hmm. what I want to do. I honestly don't want to spend yeah. four days a week doing private practice with... Mm-hmm. I mean, and I want to be careful how I say this. I just, it, I, the regular private practice of kind of folks that I knew were going to be coming to me, I just wasn't interested in. And not that I think it's important work and people need to have that, but there's a million other mm-hmm. therapists out there that can do that. Mm-hmm. And so when my perspective finally shifted and I said, no, hey, I really want to work with like white folks who really want to look at like how whiteness and racism is impacting them and how it affects their health. And then I laugh because I'm like, yeah, you can see there's a line out the door of white, <laughs> of white people knocking to say, I want to look at my whiteness. Um, right, right. So that kind of shifted into being able to do that and then bringing in all these other perspectives. So um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I started um, right outward. I, who, someone who we both know, Mary Pendergreen, um, who has yeah. her own consulting was very good about, you know, giving me some work and then really mentoring me through the process of doing a lot of, a lot of work. And because of her, I met some amazing people, you included, um, and really got some wonderful opportunities. So I started doing some workshops and I started doing trainings and consulting and coaching and just really grew um, and then started to meet people on my own and making Mm -hmm. connections. And for me, this work has been all about collaborating. Yeah. You know, you meet people, you collaborate. It's the opposite of us. It's relational work, right? Which is anti-racist, you know, not being about Mm -hmm. competition, but like, how do I build these relationships? How do I build community? But it's been scary. I mean, you know, it's been this panic of, you know, how am I going to pay the bills? How is this going to work? How am I going to do this? And Mm -hmm. there's been some panics that have led me into like taking on way more than I can. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, I'm Mm -hmm. even still, I struggle with, okay, let it go. It's like, I don't know how to do an in-between. It's either like I take so much work because I'm Mm -hmm. afraid that there won't be work next month or the following month. So that's been kind of, a practice for me um and learning Mm -hmm. how to balance that and um and I think last year the shift was like what do you really want to do right you can't do everything and what pieces make you most you know how do you feel most fulfilled right and Mm -hmm. so that has really kind of helped me kind of cement in um there's a couple folks that I've really been working with who I enjoy collaborating with um, mm-hmm. developing some of my own work with um, my partner in business. And one of my pieces is Dr. Alana Tappan. She's a psychologist mm-hmm. in Canada. And I'm um, sorry, mm-hmm. she's a psychologist mm-hmm. in Canada. And she and um, she had this idea about, we met at a conference that Dr. Ken Hardy has his Eichenberg Institute for uh, Social Justice. And we were at a conference together and she was talking to me and she said, I, I'm watching how like us folks of color are, have ancestors and have this like deep belief and I'm watching white people flounder. And she said that she herself Mm. has seen relationships with white people that she has that are caring, giving, lovely people. And then when it's, they start to talk about race and they, me included, right? It's like, all of a sudden we're like, she's like, who are these people? Like, I don't know them anymore. Mm -hmm. And what she said was like, it's the shame for you all. Like you guys get so caught up in your shame Mm -hmm. that you Mm -hmm. can't show up. Like you, you just, and she said that that's the work, like the work really needs to be about how to like get you all to not to excuse, excuse anything, but to like work through your stuff Mm 
Yeah. So that you can mm-hmm. show up. Um, and so when she told me about it, I said to her, oh, oh my God, what can I do? I'm in, what can I support you with? Um, yeah. And so for the past three years, um, we have been doing trainings and workshops. Um, and I'm really, really connected to that work. Um, yeah. It's changed me. It continues to change me. We do it with only white identified folks and we just mm-hmm. keep bringing people through and bringing people through and seeing changes. Mm-hmm. And several other folks that I'm working with. Um, so it's just grown. It is not what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you had told me like five years from now, you know, that I would be doing all this anti-racist work, I would have looked at you like, you know, me, I don't even know what I'm doing or I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, mm-hmm. And I still have those days, like by no means, you know, I have lots of work to continue to do on myself and I continue to do. We all um, do. Yeah. You know, and I would say, I think one of the things that I do want to name is one of the conflicts that's always there is mm-hmm. that I am a white woman mm-hmm. making money on racism. I mean, it feels, mm. but there's a piece of that that's very true, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I hope that I will always hold that because it's not something that I want to forget. Um, mm-hmm. And trying to balance that and think about what that means and are there places that I need to step out of and like always be looking at kind of the space that I'm, I'm in and mm-hmm. how I can bring other people with me, give opportunities to other people. Um, I've learned a lot, you know, I've learned a lot on the way yeah. and have a lot to keep learning. Yeah, I completely hear you. One of the things that I've always liked about you, Robin, and have always enjoyed in terms of working with you on different projects, and you know, like you mentioned, we met through Mary Pinder Green Consulting and her organization. And um, you know, you've always reflected on where and how you've learned and what the process has been like, and you've always named the people who were really influential for you. And, you know, in that process. And I think that that's so important because, you know, you're always consistently honoring, noting, like I didn't get here on my own and this has been a journey and a process and I've been helped this way along the way. And I think that's amazing in the spirit of collaboration, right? What we're talking about is staying in relationship with one another, you know? I mean, and it's super important, I think, as, you know, as a white woman, the more I learn, especially with other, with other women and, You know, we know the history of white women stealing from and appropriating from women of color, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and I always got to check myself with that too. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not not wanting to continue that. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so what has it been like for you doing this work? And I especially want to name, you know, doing race work through a period last year, through, you know, recent time, recent weeks even, doing race work through the pandemic, through mass protests about racism and police brutality. What has that been like for you to do this work during that time? Of course, it's been challenging, but it also has felt like I'm doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, um, I had my own reaction and it's interesting, um, you know, of course, what, like a year ago is when right around, you know, when the murders were happening and the protests yeah. and all of a sudden everybody wants to hire somebody to do this consulting work. And, and right. I remember, you know, and, I, you know, honestly, my first reaction was like, really now, like now you want to do this? Like suddenly mm-hmm. I couldn't even get a conversation with you and now you want to do this. And then I had to check myself because I'm no, you know, it's not about a better or worse. It's like, okay, well, they want to do it, you know, and Robin, you, you were that person a year ago or two years ago, Mm -hmm. or, I mean, I think the biggest challenge for me, especially in the past year has really been my work with other white people, right? Because it's had a, like, I have to be compassionate. I'm no, I'm not, I can't other myself from white people. Like I'm a white person Mm -hmm. and I have all that stuff. And I think so as, as other white folks have kind of tried to step in, it's been challenging and reminding myself that, you know, I, it's not about a comparison. It's not about uh, you're here and I'm here because I don't yeah. think that this work goes that way. I don't believe that it's linear. I think it's right. more like a spiral, right? So mm-hmm. kind of holding that compassion. And I've been kind of looking at it as like 
compassionate accountability, you know, like how mm -hmm. do I hold others accountable, but with compassion um, mm -hmm. and in a way that's, mm -hmm. you know, so I'd say the harder, you know, like within working with some of the consulting with organizations um, mm -hmm. has been super challenging because, mm -hmm. you know, I've holding both, there's been organizations where a lot of the folks of color have felt so defeated and so kind of like, oh my God, again, we have to do this right. again. And yet right. we have to, I, mean, I had somebody literally say at a workshop um, that I was co-facilitating, you know, with a woman of color and it was a mixed group, but she said, I don't know why I'm here. Mm. She said, I'm here so I can watch white people learn and process. Like, I don't want to do this. Like, this is painful. This is mm -hmm. triggering. And so I think so much of this was like balancing how do you hold harm? You know, like how do we do this work yeah. together? And how do we hold people and where they're at? Like, yes. And I believe even myself, like if white people, if we wait till we all have our shit together, we're not gonna ever be caught up. It's, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, maybe in another 300 years, right? So mm -hmm. as white people, for me, there's this knowing of like, I have to keep doing this work and I am going to continue to harm people on the way. And that is so, that's like so against who I am as a therapist. Like, wait, yeah. I have to keep doing this, but I'm going to cause harm. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes no sense. Right. But when I first, my first piece of workshop, I walked out of there like, oh yeah, I'm toxic. I'm not going to talk to another person of color ever again, because I'm just toxic. Right. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help me. It doesn't help folks of color. Um, and so it's learning yeah. how to walk that walk and change. And also I think what was happening was, you know, I'm seeing well-intentioned, good intentions, white people trying to shift and learn, mm -hmm. making mistakes, you know, causing pain, some able to kind of hold that and, and, and you know, and offer apologies some not people not knowing what they're supposed to say and not say you know it was like so high emotion which is already there around race anyway yeah but like holding this white people like trying to have empathy or not trying having empathy not knowing what to do with it and so right. many folks of color like exhausted and like you know and so trying to hold people to do this mm -hmm. organizational work and honestly the fragility of a lot of the white folks um, mm -hmm. holding that, honoring my own. Um, mm -hmm. I think the organizational work is truly and was truly challenging. And yet there were places where I could see work happening and I could see growth. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of those spaces where I might be working with a whole team, but then I was also working with like a white affinity space. So I was trying to kind of support them and yeah. still be accountable to the larger group um it was hard and then never knowing what you were gonna i remember in the very big i think like maybe april or may i was asked by uh someone who i know a black woman who has a small nonprofit. she said um i had wanted to take my staff to this conference that was supposed to happen but got canceled because of covid I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you would um, be willing to do a training with them. Yeah. And, I, and I said to her, are you sure you want me to do it? Like why, you know, you want a white woman to do this, this training for your staff? That's mo that I think her whole staff were folks of color. And mm -hmm. she said, yeah, I do. I think I want, I think there's something powerful about them hearing some of this from a white person. So mm -hmm. it was a mm -hmm. two part series. And um, the first session went pretty well. Mm -hmm. The second session was right after a murder. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, okay. So I, I stepped into the space, named what happened. They wanted nothing to do with me that day. And I got it. I no. mean, it's, it, you know, and so there was an interesting way to hold that space. It was, was this like, I get it. Um, so what do you want to do with the space right now? Like it's up right. to you, um, you know? And so we ended up using the space. I mean, that's where some flexibility of letting them just say what they wanted to say. I was there, I kind of held it, but it was really for them an opportunity to kind of like 
create their own community and create their own, um, it was a space, you know, for them to come together. Yeah. That was challenging. You know, it was really challenging. You know, it's like, Oh my God, like pick the worst day of the worst day. Right. You know, um, and it is what it, it is, what it is. So, I mean, there's always these moments and there's always things happening and you're always trying to, there's just so much trauma and so much pain and Absolutely. so much, yeah. you know, and trying to hold everybody and um, manage that can be, can be really difficult. And especially during all these murders and then people were having their own issues right. with COVID. And as we know, COVID was negatively mostly impacting, you know, higher impact in, in families of color and who was being asked right. to come back to work. And, you know, Absolutely. and so when we're having work meetings, so it was, I think like anyone doing this work with human beings, you know, being able to really honor and kind of find that place to honor and name things um, and still do the work, but to be flexible yeah. enough and humble enough, you know, to be like, I, I get what my face represents right now. I'm here mm -hmm. and how you want me to be here. And if that means stepping back, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I get it. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, so those are some challenging pieces, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I completely hear you. It it sounds like you really made the best of it, you know, in those spaces. And like you said, I think the fact that you do, um, you know, you're so attuned to who you are and what you can represent. I think that, that makes a big difference, you know, that really I mean, allows. like, you know, it's a constant, you know, I did the best I could. I learned yeah, and I can do better next time. And all the learning and all the doing, you're never going to be perfect. You know, I That's know, right. like, you know, I guess my work is like, what I've learned is how to learn from, from what I do. Right. If I do something as uncomfortable or as horrible as I feel about it, mm -hmm. I'm not going to die from being uncomfortable. Right. right. And if right. I can take that and do something with it, then mm -hmm. I feel like it's metabolized, that it has purpose, that Wonderful. I can use it with other people. And I use it in my therapy or I use it with my coaching. And I say, look, yeah. even in the workshops I do, I talk about, I always share my stories. I'm like, this is what I did. And this yeah. is what I still do. And you wanna hear how I effed up pretty bad? Yeah, I got mm -hmm. you, I'm you, like mm -hmm. still doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a piece to that. Um, that, that for me feels like what I can use, you know, a whole sense of using myself in a very different way than I would have in traditional therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm still careful with my boundaries and what I share, but at the same time, I use myself differently than I would have. Um, and I think it's important to do that, especially yeah. in this work. Mm -hmm. I, I hear you. Know. Absolutely. Yeah. So Robin, what is one thing you knew about doing this work before you got started? One thing I did know? Well, that you wish you knew. About oh, I wish I knew. Yeah, um, like coming into this. One yeah, thing so I wish I knew uh, how hard it was gonna be to say, to have boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am not good at like shutting the door, so I work from home even before COVID, unless I'm out doing something or doing a, like I'm working to home, my home, yeah. I'm lucky enough to have an office attached to my home, mm -hmm. which I thought would be wonderful. It is in many ways, but it means you never leave. Right. And it means at 10 o'clock at night, I right. wish I knew how much trouble I was going to have turning mm -hmm. off. I hear you. I thought I'd be able to do that. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm not good at it. I go on vacation and I don't, but put boundaries on my time. I'm always kind of saying, all right. Oh, and if somebody cancels, mm -hmm. oh, okay. I didn't realize um, how hard it would be to, to have boundaries um, and yeah. take care of myself um, yeah. in doing this. I think I knew I would have trouble with, um, you know, there's the anxiety again about making mm -hmm. money. I kind of knew that would be there. So I was mm -hmm. kind of expecting that. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I've expected it. I think at times it, it's really taken over when I'm not careful and has impacted my physical health. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe I didn't realize that much, right. but I'd say, you know, the anxiety of working for yourself, um, and, and not wanting to let people down. Right. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think as a white person, 
where I see a lot of struggle is kind of finding that balance between, you know, oh, I'm exhausted or like, well, you don't, me telling myself, well, you don't get to be exhausted. Like, you know, you don't get to do that. You have to keep working and keep fighting and you don't get to, there's people who can't rest and there's people, and that's all very true. And if I don't take care of myself, I can't help other people. So it's kind of like, there's this thing about whiteness, about constantly flogging myself yeah. um, that I have to be careful about and finding that balance mm -hmm. between, you know, you do need, you're allowed to take a break. You're a human being yeah. Yeah. and knowing that there's this other part that's like, you can't stop, you can't stop, you can't stop. Um, I didn't know that that was going to be such a, you know, but you don't know what you don't know yeah. um, until Absolutely. you get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah. this has been really terrific, Robin. And I just Aww. want to say thank you for being so open and transparent and, you know, just sharing your journey with us and, uh, and this I really so appreciate the important work you do. Thanks, yeah. Amanda. I totally, you know how much, I mean, for your, I admire you tremendously um, you. and really enjoy the times that we got to work together and very much appreciate you um, including me on one of your podcasts. My pleasure. So my partner thank you so robin if people want to find you where can they find you um i have a website and it's uh robin schlanger lcsw.com all okay. all together mm -hmm. uh they can email me at um robin.schlanger at gmail.com terrific um yep and everything's listed on the website all the different services um and ways to reach out to me okay wonderful well, thank you so much for this, Robin, and we Thank will you, talk Amira. soon. I Appreciate hope so. It. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.